wait for Calvin. He's trying to dial things in. All right, everybody good to go? Well, good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank the many Vermonters who have submitted nominations for a ray of kindness in the last week. As a reminder, each December for the past four years, we put out a call to Vermonters to nominate people in their community for their acts of kindness and goodwill. I think it's important with all the negativity we see out there to remind ourselves there's far more good in the world that happens every single day and we should call attention to it. So again, no act of kindness is too small. If you've seen someone who should be recognized for going above and beyond, let us know at governor.vermont.gov slash kindness. Next, as you may know, this week we announced the launch date for online sports wagering in Vermont, January 11th, right before the NFL playoffs begin. As a result, there's been a lot of interest, so I asked Commissioner Knight <clears throat> to join us today to go over the process, how it will work, and answer any questions you might have. As a reminder, in 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the federal ban that was in place and states began to move forward. I first proposed legalizing sports wagering in 2019, and the legislature finally agreed this year, and I signed it into law. We know many Vermonters already have been involved in sports betting for quite a few years. We also know every one of our neighboring states has already legalized. And as a state with a lot of tourism, many visitors come to Vermont and would have placed bets but couldn't, uh, leading to lost revenue for our state. By legalizing it and bringing it above board, not only does it uh, allow the state to gain revenue, but it also allows us to put consumer protections in place and support addiction prevention initiatives. The Department of Liquor and Lottery is partnering with the Department of Mental Health on this important work. So I want to thank Commissioner Knight and her team for their efforts to stand this up and the legislature for their partnership in getting this across the finish line. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Knight. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everyone. I know this is a departure from my normal role of being the sound check for these press conference, so it's nice to be here to talk about online sports wagering. First, I would like to thank the governor for his leadership on this issue and his commitment to seeing that um, sports wagering is legalized. I echo the governor's um, appreciation for the legislature that uh, worked with us collaboratively to create a legal framework for sports betting. I want to give a special shout out to Senator Dick Sears. He was one of my colleagues on the Sports Betting Study Committee, and he has probably been advocating for legalized sports betting as long as the governor. So thank you, Senator. We did it. Um, I am grateful to all of the operators who are interested in Vermont and who took the time to submit bids. I am especially thankful uh, for DraftKings, FanDuel, Fanatic Sportsbook for their responsiveness, expertise, and patience as we negotiated the contracts and set up this framework, excuse me, the last two months. We are really looking forward to a strong and successful partnership over the next few years. So how is this going to work? Uh, the Act authorizes the department to set up mobile sports wagering, and that's done through apps on our phone. It's not offered at this point in retail locations or through Vermont lottery agents. Beginning today, players will be able to download the apps from, from DraftKings and FanDuel's to set up their accounts, learn about sports betting in Vermont, responsible gaming, and be ready to wager when we go live July, July. Good Lord, January 11th, 2024. Fanatics Sportsbook will launch shortly thereafter. They have been in the process of expanding across multiple states and did not want to commit to launching uh, January 11th. They wanted to be able to have a, a premier experience in Vermont, so they're going to go shortly after. We've been working closely with them on that date. It'll probably be the end of January, beginning of February. 
essentially through these contracted arrangements, we are allowing these companies to operate their s mobile sports platforms in Vermont under our specific rules and regulations in exchange for that per privilege we earn a percentage of their revenue and they pay us an operator fee. So let's talk a little bit about the safeguards. So we've worked diligently to create these important safeguards to make this as safe and enjoyable as possible for players. This includes limiting this to people 21 years and older, not permitting the use of credit cards, not allowing wagers on Vermont collegiate sports unless they are in a tournament, prohibiting operators from depicting underage persons in their advertising, not permitting betting on sports whose participants are primarily under the age of 18, and not describing bets as free bets unless they are in fact free. These safeguards are in addition to the established rep responsible gaming programs that operators have across the country that include player limits, timeouts, and responsible gaming resources. As the governor said, the Department of Liquor and Lottery is working closely with the Department of Mental Health to create a robust responsible gaming program here in Vermont aimed at mitigating any potential risks. This includes awareness and education, educating players about what responsible gaming looks like, the uh, responsible gaming practices such as setting limits, allowing a self-exclusion list, identifying problem gambling so that we understand players understand the signs that they might have a problem with addictive behavior or problem gambling, and then those support services for problem gambling, including a helpline and referral services to treatment and to providers. An important note that this is the first time the state has created dedicated funding for responsible gaming. That is very a, a very good development. Revenue. Okay, so the revenue source comes from two places. One is the operator fee. The operators each will pay us $550,000. That's not to be assessed more than once every three years. That is designed to cover the cost to administer and regulate the program for the department. Within 30 days of the contract execution, we, which happened on Friday, December 8th, we will receive 1.65, sorry, $1,650,000. Adam will be happy for that, Adam Grashen. Did you hear that, Adam? got some money coming. Um, so most of the revenue comes from the responsible of the re revenue share, of course. Under the contracts that we've executed with the operators, the state will earn a range of 31 to 33 percent of their adjusted gross sports wagering revenue. That revenue is received monthly through electronic transfer of funds, much like the department through the Vermont Lottery receives from our um, Vermont Lottery vendor. This revenue from the sports wagering goes directly to the general fund. So based on the market analysis from what we received from the operators, we are anticipating up to $7 million in revenue from this revenue share in the first full year of operations. Obviously, this will grow as we evolve and the market matures. Based on the information we've received from the operators, they expect maturity to be in about five years, and they're estimating that the marketplace in Vermont will be about $55 million. So we can see our revenue from this program increasing. In five years, we could potentially see 16 to $18 million in revenue from the revenue shares. So the selection process. How did we get here? So the sports wagering RFP was sent out on July 19th. The bids were received September 6th. And the best and final offer revenue share was due on September 22nd. We received five bids from established operators who are working across the country in multiple states. Bet MGM, DraftKings, FanDuel, Fanatic Sportsbook, and Penn Sports Interactive, known as ESP ESPN Bet. Of the five received bids, one, Penn Sports Interactive, was deemed non-compliant and not accepted because some of the required documents were not included in the proposal as requested. 
The four remaining bids were evaluated by the department using the evaluation criteria that was approved by the Board of Liquor and Lottery and with the guiding principles established by the Sports Betting Study Committee, which I chaired, that in was included in the bill as the intent of the legislature that gave the department priorities, and that were to protect Vermonters from problem gambling, convert the illegal market to the legal market, and maximize revenue to the state. Based on a rigorous evaluation of the technical and the revenue criteria, the department selected the three operators that we have revealed in our press release that we're talking about today, DraftKings, FanDuel, Fanatics, Sportsbook. Award letters were sent out on September 28th. We entered into contract negotiations the following Monday, which was October 2nd, and we executed contracts on December 8th. Our intent in announcing the January launch today is to give operators the opportunity to pre-register players, right? We want to let people know that Vermont is going to allow sports wagering January 1. And that is why we were, were here today announcing this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. With that, we'll open up to questions. Yes. How do you, how do you define revenue? The net or the gross? Yes. Is that what you're asking? No sales? No. Or profit? So it's the adjusted gross sports wagering revenue is the gross revenue, less any voided bets, less the winnings paid out, less federal excise tax. It does not include their operating costs. Pardon me? It does not include their operating costs. Uh, I can give you the definition of that. That's right. Okay. This is only for apps, mobile sports betting. Do you see 5, 10, 15 years down the road uh, casinos or, or buildings or lobbies where people can go and pull, pull the lever, so to speak? Yeah, I, th I don't see us going in that direction, but uh, that will obviously be up to a future legislature. Um, but uh, but I think this is a step forward and in, in going with what is uh, I think been more customary uh, in recent years across the country. I, I don't know if we if, as Vermont can control this, but like how how big of a concern is corruption in sports? You know, with with side bets and people saying, hey, you know, if you miss this shot or if you do this. You know, what, what do you think? I know that's kind of yeah. a little bit outside of our yeah, purview. Is that, it really is, is outside, but, uh, but obviously a concern. Um, it's been, it's probably nothing new either. So um, I think we've had some, some famous uh, instances of uh, corruption in sports. Um, but, um, but obviously uh, we're dependent on the organizations that oversee uh, sports uh, because they don't want to, to taint their image either. So. And we're relying on them uh, to make sure that they play by the rules. Is this 24-7 worldwide sports? I'm, I'm sorry? 24-7 worldwide sports, can I get on cricket? So we developed, the department is responsible for developing a sports wagering catalog, and that t outlines the sports wagering events and the sporting events um, that are authorized, and I'm happy to share that with you. So essentially what we do is we look for to ensure that there's a governing body, um, and we look at U.S. integrity to make sure that these um, sporting leagues and sports have been sanctioned um, and that, that, are, that are deemed uh, you know, to be operating in sporting events with integrity. It's just American sports? No. No, not at worldwide all. Sports. Yeah, worldwide sports, correct. So we don't, we have not allowed in our sports wagering category um, leagues, for example, uh, in world conflicts. So you won't find the Hockey Federation of Russia on the list, for example. You won't find um, uh, leagues where um, most of the participants are primarily under the age of 18. So you won't see Olympic skateboarding, for example, or gymnastics, because most of those competitors are under 18. You won't see uh, whitewater kayaking, for example, um, because they don't have a governing body that's been 
deemed, you know, operating with the level of uh, organization and integrity that U.S. integrity has. Okay, thank you. You're How about the NCAA hockey and basketball championships? Yes, all of those are on the sports media catalog. So when catalog. UBM goes, people be able to vote on uh, to to bet on. on That's UBM. correct. So um, wagering on Vermont collegiate sports teams is not permitted unless they are in a tournament. Oh. So if your example, if UVM men's basketball or women's basketball for that matter, were in the NCAA tournament, we would, as Vermonters, be able to bet on that team in the tournament. So, uh, uh, Governor, right now the state is earning revenue from, well, with this anyway, uh, liquor, marijuana, and gambling. Um, the legislature has looked at prostitution and fentanyl and heroin uh, decrim or legalization. Where are you on repealing vice laws in those areas as possible revenue earners? Yeah, I'm a pretty firm no on that. I think to, to compare the two, legalization of heroin and uh, sports betting, I think are two different animals, and uh, I'm a firm no. I am interested in what's your favorite cricket team, though, James. <laughs> That's what country I'm in. <laughs> uh, did you say you can only do three bets at a time? Did I get that? No, I didn't say that. Okay. No. I'm, okay, then I misunderstood whatever you said. <laughs> Not being able to bet on Vermont collegiate sports, is that just for Vermont, or could I, for instance, bet on my beloved Penn State Nittany Lions? Yes, you can bet on out of state collegiate sports. Okay. So your Penn State Nittany, Nittany Lions you could bet on in Vermont. Why is that? that Vermont collegiate sports are because it's such a small state. Why is that? Yeah, I think this is a question for the legislature, right? So they, they drafted the bill with our assistance and they wanted to ensure um, the integrity of Vermont sports and didn't want, I guess the idea is it because it's such a small state, if we had people wagering on UVM or St. Mike's or whoever, there might be an opportunity to sway the outcome of the sport. But that's really a question for the legislature. And as far as the restriction on uh, players to be 21 or over, how is that verified? It's verified through identi identity ver verification processes. So one of the things that we have in the bill and in our enhanced procedures is a photo identification process. And so uh, the operators will use um, platforms like ID.me that the IRS uses. You're welcome. So for one reason, one of these sports books, by some drastic reason, had to shutter and I guess close down. I guess where would the liability lie to pay out the customers and people that use the sports books? I'm sorry, what is your question, Stephen? So say if for some reason a sports book, whether it's maybe some federal investigation, they by happens chance go bankrupt, something happens where they can no longer operate, but people have their money in their balance accounts, whose kind of liability, where would that fall on, and who's in charge of paying those out? Yes, yes, there are per, uh, per measures in place. So we have a performance bond, we have a litigation bond, we have a certificate of compliance, and I'm happy to give you those details after, because I don't have that in this brain right now. <laughs> when it comes down to Vermonters having to file any taxes on their wins? Oh, yes, that's a great question. Um, they are, um, and I don't have the right language, but uh, we did talk about this in statute, and Commissioner Bolio did, clarified that they are required to report their winnings. If you go on some of the apps, you will see the forms there for them to um, submit. It's on the player's responsibility to submit their winnings. Maybe. Uh, report their losses? I don't know that question. I don't know the answer to that question. Do you know the threshold for having so. to file? I know some states um, you have to file if you win over 600. I'm sorry, I don't have that answer, but Commissioner Bolio probably does. I'm not putting him on the spot, but we will get you that answer. I just don't happen to, happen to have it. Is he on? Governor, I have a question about the unemployment system. It seems like this week, um, there's maybe past few days, there's been folks that haven't been able to get through, haven't been able to file their, their weekly claims. Can you shed a little light on, on what's happening? Yeah, it's a, you know, a product of the probably 60-year-old legacy system that we have right now and what we're modernizing. But it's one more piece, you know. 
They've used a lot of uh, different uh, software type situations to, to prop it up, to keep it going. And one of those apparently failed, but I might let Commissioner Harrington uh, give us some more details on that. Commissioner Harrington. Thank you, Governor. Um, and thanks for the question. It's a, a good opportunity for us to be able to share an update with the public. So um, we noticed coming into this week um, that claimants began calling our call center because uh, when they went into the claimant portal, they couldn't click the link to file for the, the previous week uh, like they would typically do. Um, that caused us to continue to do a review and investigation of the system. And what we found is that um, a subset or portion of our climate population um, are experiencing this issue. So we're working hand in hand with the Agency of Digital Services to troubleshoot the issue and make sure that claimants uh, can file. Um, but uh, in the interim, what's happening also, and I know this is causing a lot of frustration for folks, is that um, when the claimants are figuring out that they can't file, they're calling our Claimant Assistance Center, uh, which is overloading our lines and causing extreme hold time. So I know that's just adding to the frustration. I think what I would just want to um, reassure folks is that uh, we are reviewing the situation. Um, folks won't lose out on their benefits. If we get, they have until, uh, traditionally they have until the end of the week to file for the, the prior week. If for some reason this issue isn't resolved by Friday, uh, we'll certainly extend the filing so that folks um, can continue to file uh, and receive their benefits. I think that the unfortunate piece is that um, folks who traditionally file early in the week uh, may not uh, receive their benefits as timely as they typically would, um, but we'll ensure that the benefits get paid out. Um, and again, I also recognize that, um, you know, this. It truly is a technical issue, as the governor said. It's related to our age-old system um, and the processing that it goes through on a, on a daily basis. Um, but it's leading to also a, an overwhelming number of calls coming into our call center and, and people having to remain on hold for um, you know many, in some cases, multiple hours. So um, certainly trying to address each one of these uh, as we go forward and, and looking forward to the day we have a modern system. Commissioner, do you know how many people uh, aren't able to get through? Like, how long is this, this backlog, or how many people are running into this issue? Uh, I don't have the, the total number, but what I can tell you is that we typically have anywhere at this point uh, 2,000 to 2,500 individuals filing for benefits. Um, I can get you the most recent uh, number, but um, it obviously it changes each week. Uh, and right now, um, it looks like it probably is around the you know 10 to 20 percent range of that population. Again, um, some of it's hard to tell because we don't know until the individual um, calls and says they're running into an issue. Uh, but we are doing a review of um, the the different um, accounts to see if we can get a better idea of exactly how many people are impacted. But it's in the it's in the hundreds. It's not the the total population. Population. Governor, after the tsunami of uh, unemployment claims during the pandemic, it clogged things up. There was a, a reckoning, if you will, of like, hey, we need to invest in, in state IT. I think in your budget a few years ago, you would put in sort of ongoing um, on money to, to put toward IT systems. I know you mentioned labor has been investing. We redid the DMV computer. But, but why are we still running into these issues? I mean, what, what is it about IT or why, why, why are, is this still an issue? We're, well, we're so reliant on it at this point in time. And um, when you look at how long it takes to build the system, like DMV, for instance, DMV, um, we've we put money forward <clears throat> back when I was in the, in the Senate. Um, and some of those systems never came to fruition for one reason or another. I think the uh, one one company went bankrupt or sold to another or something happened, and we never did build the system back 15, 20 years ago when we should have. Um, so resurrecting that, uh, getting back uh, with this agency of digital services, I think I saw, said last week, I think it's one of our you know proudest uh, accomplishments over the last seven years, creating that that uh, agency uh, because now someone is focused on this and so 
we put a lot of money in place with, uh, with the help of the legislature, but we have a long ways to go because we're so far behind uh, previous to that. This, again, this, this labor uh, situation has been kicked down, the can has been kicked down the road for decades. Um, and then we've, even since we've been in, we've, we've asked for money and, and the legislature hasn't opted to, to put money into the system. Um, but after the pandemic, we all saw uh, what could happen. And, uh, and I think that we came to the conclusion that we needed to do something. I think there was hope that uh, because the, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, oversees this, that they would be putting money into place. And we tried different scenarios uh, to, uh, to accomplish that and just never worked. So again, we're, we're moving forward at this point. And another flood of money, COVID money could be spent on that? Um, there, I, I don't know what buckets um, the money that we appropriated, uh, certainly the ARPA money, I think is being utilized for some of that. Um, so whatever we could use, we were using um, because they're expensive systems. What are some of the other IT systems that do um, it, Yeah, it's just across the board and every, I mean, the shelf life of any IT system uh, is uh, not extended uh, for a long period of time and uh, we have some legacy systems that probably should have ADS. Is ADS on at this point? Uh, is, do you know? Yes. Denise, Denise, do you have, um, did you hear the question? I mean, how many other systems are we working on and how many do we have um, to on our plate at this point in time? For major modernization projects, we are tracking um, six major modernization projects right now, just coming into this fiscal year. Uh, the number of systems that are outdated um, and need replacing exists in every single one of the departments and agencies today. And so we are looking to prioritize those. And it's not as simple as just replacing tech and replacing the technology system. There is a uh, a hand-in-hand -hand effort that goes alongside our partners in state government as well because this impacts Vermonters. So we need to make sure that we can manage the pace of that, but also the funding behind um, those systems too. So we're, it's a balancing act. And as you can see, I'm, I am speaking as uh, Commissioner Harrington because I am in his office right now focused very heavily on resolving this UI um, situation. Those six major modernization projects that you said, number one, what are they? And two, do you mean that they're already funded or that you don't have the funding yet? And I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, the current IT modernization funds that have been new into this fiscal year. And we have a Enterprise Project Management Office website with, um, on the Agency of Digital Services um, public website that shows all of our active projects right now. And so that list is visible there on the things that we're working on. We've got a few folks on the phones we'll go to, then we'll come back to the room. We'll start with Keith, the Rotten Herald. Hi, so this question is about um, the state's social media presence. I understand it's uh, pretty decentralized, but I did wonder um, with some of the shakeups and potential shakeups in the social media landscape, if there was anybody thinking about like a long-term strategy as far as what platforms state government uses, um, whether to adopt new ones or discard ones it's using or whatever the case may be. I just didn't know if there was like a a long-term view of this, or if it's just sort of a, comes together organically or what? That would, I don't know. Denise, would you have any input on that? Uh, we, we do look to our engagement with both the um, communication team as well as the chief marketing office for that type of information. Uh, okay, thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, I was curious if you had a chance yet to look at the Natural Resources Board Necessary Updates to Act 250 document that was released. 
I have not. Um, I'm aware that it's out at this point in time. It's been, I think, uh, a couple of years in the making, um, long before we identified housing as, you know, a focus point. Um, so I'll take a look. Uh, but our focus, as I've said, over the last you know, year or so, um, and certainly of of, of recent uh, recently. Uh, that we'll be focusing on housing. So anything in the report uh, that would expedite housing, uh, then we will pull that in. But we have some other ideas as well. So this is this is a group that was uh, has been working on this for at least a year or two. And um, but I'll look at it and see if there's anything that we can uh, utilize in our package to uh, to expedite housing. Well, it stuck out. Uh among many things I'm sure depending on what happens on that hearing was that the group wants uh, until 2026 to actually implement the changes uh, given the housing crisis and the need to act immediately uh, to try and make up some of the ground for the lack of housing in Vermont. Uh, what's your sense of that timeline? Yeah, to, to be fair, uh, their, their charge was to look at Act 250 broadly. Again, this has been two years in the making or so. Um, but now we have a, a critical crisis on our hands in terms of housing. Uh, so um, you can rest assured that we'll be putting forward some regulatory changes uh, for the legislature to consider. And if there are any, is anything in that report that we can utilize, we'll utilize them. Um, but uh, we have some other ideas as well. Thank you. No other questions. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll go back to the room. Governor, I know we've asked you about uh, Franklin County Sheriff John Gerson's work in the long time at this point, but with his law enforcement license, um, I know the Sheriff Association has asked him to step down um, and I'll, I'm sure there'll be more adding to that. I think it would be the best thing for everyone, um, maybe not for him personally, but uh, for, for everyone else to step down. Um, but um, it's his prerogative at this point and it's my understanding that he's not going to. So we'll see what the legislature does. Uh, I know that there's still the impeachment hearings that are, I believe, still ongoing, but I haven't been following them either. Um, but um, but I would say, you know, it's, it's a high bar. Impeachment is a high bar, and it should be. Um, so we'll see whether this is an impeachable offense or not. Um, but uh, we have to be careful with that. How do you balance the... Um I guess accountability measures that Grismar has already faced and calls for him to step down from folks at the Sheriff's Association with the will of the voters. Yeah, no, I think the will of the voters comes first. Um, they went in with their eyes wide open. I don't, I can't believe there was too many voters that hadn't seen the video of what happened and they still voted him in. So, you know, Franklin, Franklin County has made their choice. That's why I'm saying be careful uh, in terms of we may not like somebody, um, but that's not an impeachable, impeachable offense. Um, so we'll see what happens with the legislature. But again, I think uh, maybe this decision will have to be made in the voters booth. Question about the uh, along I-91 in the Upper Valley, you've probably seen there's a uh, trailers that are parked at, uh, at, at one of those spots. Um, do you know what that rest area is being used for? That is the location for those uh, temporary mobile units that will be going to different parts of the state, but primarily uh, for Montpelier when that's completed. Do you know people are living there? No. Right, right now, so those are empty. No, they're just storage, just stored there in, in anticipation. We've seen a number of, of civilian-looking cars, normal cars, traffic in and out of there. I mean, do you have you seen what's what's going on there? Like, why? I, what's I have not. Is happening? Uh, unless they're, I, I don't know. Um, FEMA is 
has utilized that area. Um, there, it's under their jurisdiction at this point in time. Um, so, maybe a better question for them. Are they paying the state to use that spot? Uh, they paid to upgrade uh, the the area, uh, which was a payment enough in some respects. We'll be able to utilize that in the future for safety stops and so forth. Well, I was going to say, what, what are those upgrades? DMV, oh, well, paving. Um, they they reclaimed a lot of the area. And uh, so it was an expensive project. I guess why? Now, I know the Montpelier uh, project has coming, it's coming along very slowly. Even as of yesterday, there's no development up there. I mean, why, why does it seem like you know, none of these trailers have been moved. There's there's no movement to help Vermonters in, in need here. Yeah, well, again, I think we're putting, they were hope, hoping uh, to develop one park and um, like they've done in other states and uh, they just didn't find anything that was suitable that was out of the floodplain and had the infrastructure needed, the water, the sewer, the storm water and so forth. And uh, so they came to the conclusion that Montpelier, um, the country club, uh, land was uh, best suited for that and now you know we're in a we're in the season when it's going to be difficult in terms of and, um, construction and and uh, excavation and so forth but they're they're supposedly going to start and we'll see uh, see how they produce what's your conflict level of, of, of like if they're actually going to break ground on on that project I'm, I'm confident they're going to break ground uh, on the project I'm confident of that and I've been reassured by um, General Roy from FEMA and uh, in fact uh, I think you should talk to him but I but I believe that they've they've got a, a fairly aggressive schedule lined up maybe like seven days a week um, and maybe 12 hours a day something like that uh, so but these are these conditions, as we know, with the frost and so forth, make it much more difficult, much slower uh, than it would take in the in the summer. That's why we don't do as much construction in the winter. I guess just a couple weeks ago, I think it was Kevin, maybe from Seven Days, that asked about sort of what's the timeline. You said two to three weeks, and I guess we're here. We are. Any, yeah. any updated? I think e every day I expect them to break ground or break frost or whatever they do. If they were looking for one specific park type area where all of these trailers could have gone, I mean, not to be crass, but couldn't anyone kind of look at the situation we've got going on in Vermont and say that that sort of location just did not exist? Well, I, I would have considered, I would have thought that it would have been easier than it was, uh, to be honest with you. I, I would have uh, considered many other options, but. Um, but they have certain criteria uh, that they live by. And, and being outside the floodplain was a big, um, a big flag, red flag in, in some respects, because we have so much of our infrastructure, our water, sewer and storm water and so forth are in some of the, the floodways uh, and they won't put uh, any units there. So that precluded all of that uh, from being considered. So then you move from there, and you know it's just it's much more difficult than you might think. Okay. Last week you uh, said something like uh, the, the cost per student was very high, and you're going to have a huge bump in property taxes, and you were going to expect improvement in schools. Uh, but specifically, do you have a plan to improve schools? No, I think what we need to do is we need to have this take the politics out of this and have a real conversation with the legislature about moving forward. How do we get a bigger bang for our buck? Uh, how do we reduce costs? And uh, how do we give kids what they need to succeed in the world? So it's, uh, you know, that's what we should be doing ongoing. I, I understand that, but we're locally controlled in terms of our education system. And we have a funding mechanism that uh, that doesn't have a, give us a lot of control either. I mean, all the money, all the budgets are produced, and then all the money, you know, if all the all the bills come due, it goes in one big pot, and then we distribute from there. So it it leads to an escalation. There's no cap on anything. And then, but there's no common curriculum of what is needed 
for the kids to go out and prosper? Well, I think it's it's if you look at the the reading and math scores uh, of late, uh, they're not moving in the right direction, and that's what I'm getting at. Um, some of the fundamentals uh, I think we're missing in some respect, and and that's the discussion we need to, to have holistically with the legislature. Other interested parties, or just the legislature? Well, anybody else that has ideas, I think we should listen just like we normally would in any legislative process, uh, the general public as well, and the teachers, and, and we're all in this together. I think we all want the same thing. How we get there is, uh, is the question, and uh, how do we, how, do we um, how can we afford uh, what, what may be contemplated? What are we going to do without? But, um, but I do know this. I mean, when you look at the demographics in the state, things aren't really getting any better. Um, we're having, and I used these numbers before, but the number, if you look over the last 10 to 20 years, the number of people over 65 now has increased dramatically. And we're losing that, the middle portion, the, the workforce. And that's, that's what we're struggling with as well. So the answer is, as I've said, Many, many times we need more taxpayers, not more taxes. Um, and we need more people uh, to actually do the work that we so desperately need. Um, so from my standpoint, that means we need a, a more affordable Vermont. And um, raising taxes isn't going to get us there. Uh, Governor, do you welcome the reassignment of Judge Justin Gyron to family court? I think uh, it's a separate branch of uh, government, and I respect uh, their role in that. Did you offer any advice, any thoughts on the matter to I, them beforehand? I was not asked for my opinion. Okay. Back to the questions on education, have you maybe put out any invitations to pertinent legislative committee chairs? to have sit-down discussions? No, but it, we know we're going to have to at some point here. I mean, this December 1st letter, we didn't know uh, what was coming either. Um, I saw the letter at probably uh, about the same time everyone else did, maybe a couple days before. But um, but it was a, a shock to me that it was that the increase was that high. Do you think you should sit down with legislators before I think, the session starts? Or? Well, I think we, I, I think at this point in time, I think we all have to contemplate where we go from here. So I'm sure that there, I mean, this is the second half of the biennium. Many committees are meeting. I'm sure that they're talking about what they might be able to do to accomplish the goals that we've set out at a price we can afford. But um, so we're still, this isn't a brand new session. This is just the second half of this, uh, of this game. Would you include the union? I think they have to be included. Yeah. Everyone should be included because, as I've said, we're in this together. Thank you all very much.